Nature Works podcast. Conversations with extraordinary guests who are working to protect, regenerate, and better understand the natural world. With your host, Mike Weeks. Welcome to Nature Works podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking to my old friend, Oliver Wright, who happens to be a world class professional wildlife photographer and also a wilderness guide who takes people deep into the regions of Sweden that are well above the Arctic Circle. We discuss Oliver's disdain for his corporate lifestyle and how it moved him towards a dream career photographing animals, birds, bees, bugs. Some of his bugs images are literally transformative in perspective. I won't say much more now because we go deep into both the descriptions and also looking at some of the most incredible images I've ever seen in my life. We also discuss individual photos and the preparation and commitment required to get the perfect shot, including weeks of morning travel uh, through the countryside and planning and prepping to get that perfect moment in time. As usual, this episode's filmed, and for this one especially, I highly recommend that viewers watch it on YouTube so that they can see the incredible images that we discuss. Now, if you enjoyed this episode and others, please share with uh, folks who care about the natural world. NatureWorks podcast always aims to provide honest and unbiased insights into how we can help protect, restore, and regenerate the natural world. And look, it's obvious, isn't it? We'll only protect what we care about. And hopefully these conversations can at least inspire some respect, maybe even some awe, and best of all, a love for the natural world. That was a three, two, one. We are live recording. Well, we're live recording, but we're not live broadcasting. Although there isn't much difference because we never edit these videos. So if you end up getting verbal diarrhea or saying something about your boss, although you don't have a boss anymore, um, no. then uh, it won't get edited out, I'm afraid. It's all warts and all here, the full kimono up over my head and over yours. <laughs> have to try not be too Yorkshire, don't swear too much. Exactly, yeah. Um, Oliver, what a uh, delight to have you on the podcast right now. Um, no... Uh, less a reason because yesterday we tried to do it and we had massive technical issues our end which we've now earned out turns out that you have to switch the little switch to the left not to the right then that allows us to record everything um, and I am now for the first time using a new 64 inch uh, television screen and um, I'm excited about that because you are a, uh, a master photographer and we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of your images here and i apologize for people who are listening to this on the podcast we're going to encourage you to actually go onto youtube and watch the video because um oliver's images are absolutely incredible uh, but we will go through descriptions of those images um so that people listening just on audio can actually get a sense of what we're talking about um before i uh, ask you to introduce yourself Oh, I'm just going to tell a little story on why it is or how it is, I should say, that you and I are on this podcast right now. So oh. um, I am an absolute nerd, avid lover of all things ornithology. And for the I've had we've recorded 10 interviews with scientists and conservationists on the Nature Works podcast. But I've been desperate to find somebody who is a, a bird, an animal photographer and so i started trawling through twitter and most of my twitter feed actually uh, is animal uh, um, photos bird photos and environmentalists and this image came up that then i scrolled down and there was a, a video of a jenny wren a wren a, U, a british wren which is the second smallest bird in britain i believe behind the fire crest or the gold crest and it, the image literally caught my breath and that's appropriate because the wren itself is 
backlit against the morning sun in a temperature range that allows its breath to be caught on the image. And I looked at this and then I scrolled through a few more of the photographer's images on Twitter. And lo and behold, I thought, I know that name, Oliver C. Wright. That sounds like my old mate who I lost saw over 20 odd years ago. Uh, because we were both climbers and uh, young, enthusiastic travellers. And so I did a double check. I went to the website and stalked this photographer. And here he is. And uh, it turns out that I uh, I didn't actually know that that Ol had become a professional photographer. But um, that's how right now an old friend of mine, who I haven't spoken to in probably over well over 20 odd years, over 20 years yeah yeah Isn't, he is now a guest on the podcast so i i wanted to tell that little story because i thought it was really serendipitous um but i'm surprised you haven't actually so far been asked to go on a, a hundred podcasts with the photos and skill level that you exhibit in your work across twitter and across your website it's probably because i spend too much time taking pictures and not <laughs> enough time doing any marketing <laughs> As you can tell from from Oliver's voice, he's a northerner. Um, you're in Leeds, aren't you? We're just outside Leeds. I am, yeah, yeah. And um, before we dive we dive into your photography and how it came about, is is Leeds a particularly good place for wildlife photography, or were you, are you up there because out of sort of family? Uh, I'm, I'm just here from a family perspective. Um, I, you know, Jen. Well, it's a tale in itself, actually, because, you know, if anybody looks at my website, they'll be like, does Oliver spend all his time in Scandinavia? Because, uh, yeah, a lot of my work is done in northern Scandinavia. Um, and when I first got into photography, it's a bit like my old sort of travel bug, bug with climbing. You know, I'd, I'd be going to Costa Rica, I'd be going to Namibia. And, you know, at the time I had a I had a corporate job and. Um, and my camera skills weren't very good, but I used to go off and spend a lot of money traveling, etc. cetera. Um, but now actually I do a whole load of photography just locally. And, and that sort of got a bit, for that got forced as well with the pandemic, of course, you know, where um, everybody, yeah, especially in the UK, it was a pretty rigorous lockdown. Um, and I've actually, I, as much as that was a pretty rubbish time for everybody, it has got me to appreciate how much wildlife there actually is on my doorstep. It's probably something worth talking about in, in a lot more detail later on. Um, but no, Leeds is not seen as a, as a particularly wildlife diverse place. And I'm living here purely because my dad lives about half a mile in that direction on his own. And it, you know, it just makes life easier, but Leeds is quite sort of central in the UK. So um for any work I'm doing in the UK, it's 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 very easy to jump in the car and get pretty much anywhere, really. Hey, you've you've got correct me if I'm wrong here, because I've climbed obviously in some of the areas outside of Leeds only a handful of times, and so there's a lot of moorland, isn't there, around? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 and it's not far to the um, Yorkshire Dales, um, and you you'll have climbed at Malham and Kelsey Crags and what have you. You know, they're only an hour and a bit away, and then you've got. Um, You've got a few gritstone areas which are quite a bit closer than that. You must have climbed at Armscliff Crag back in the yes, day. Correct, yeah. 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 But the but the moorlands themselves, even though they look picturesque in the summertime and with a frost in the winter, they look beautiful and compelling. They're actually a a bit of a wildlife dead zone, aren't they? Because because yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. the they're severely managed. <laughs> yeah yeah Exp t t talk to me a little bit about that management piece because i you know you as a local certainly know more than me all i know is that they uh, that they are managed for sh shooting is yep. that correct yep. yeah um, yeah yeah and pretty much beyond that that becomes the priority is shooting grouse it absolutely is i mean I, yeah i don't want to say anything too controversial um, oh, go on go on <laughs> but yeah i mean <laughs> All, all, all across this region, you've got lots of you've got lots of managed air. Well, in fact, you know, if if you were to go up in an aeroplane above where I live, you know, it's it's lots of towns and villages, and you've got Leeds as a major city, and then you've got lots of areas of fields, which you know is just agriculture, um, and they tend to be sort of derivative of most wildlife as well. And you've got 
then if, if you if you go a little bit further, uh, if if you go north, you start to get to a lot of moorland, um, and that moorland is sort of is generally owned by people, um, and it is utilised as basically yeah, just big shooting ranges. So they have what we call gamekeepers, um, and a gamekeeper because I know that, yeah, if I say that term at home, everybody's going to know what it is, but probably people listening to the podcast around the world won't. But a gamekeeper is somebody who um, manages that area and basically kills anything that would kill what they want to shoot. So they um, they release birds on there, grouse, uh, mainly, mainly grouse, and they feed those birds. And then um, rich people fly in from around the world and they uh, hide on behind these things called butts and they send people out who scare the grouse up and then these people shoot the grouse. And the gamekeepers basically kill anything that may have a chance of predating those grouse. So there's a, there's a beautiful bird that we get in the UK called a hen harrier, um, which is a, you know, a raptor, a bird of prey. Um, and they will, you know, they will feed on grouse, but they won't take that many of them. And yeah, there's, 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 it's been like an ongoing saga for probably the last hundred years of um, trying to get hen harriers sort of re-established back through England. Um, but yeah, so we've got these, we've got these beautiful moorland and they look fantastic. Um, but if you go to photograph wildlife on them, all you will photograph is grouse. <laughs> so I know a lot about gamekeeping because I almost became a gamekeeper. Um, mm-hmm. I actually got a place at home, Lacey Agricultural College in Herefordshire. And then I was destined to go to uh, Lanark in Scotland and work yeah. on a, a pheasant estate. No, it would have been a grouse estate with some pheasants up there um, for a famous golfer, actually. I can't remember his name. No, Anyway, I was 16 or 17. And a couple of days before going there, my best friend at the time said he was going to America to go rock climbing. And I'd become an avid rock climber, ironically, um or or confusingly i'd also become a vegetarian which was going to be a problem moving up to <laughs> become a gamekeeper so i i tossed a coin believe it or not on the night two nights before i was meant to go up there i tossed a coin with my mate on the phone and it was heads i go to america and it was tells i go up to scotland and do this gamekeeper thing because all my childhood had all been spent in the countryside shooting and fishing and fly fishing and being with my lurchers and terriers and anyway it landed on climbing and the, uh, for me, the rest was history because I then spent 10 years traveling the world as a climber. But I know exactly. So I remember the head gamekeeper talking to me over the phone and saying, when you get here, we'll teach you all of the tricks of how to get around the rules for uh, killing Harry, uh, for killing um, raptors. Because yeah. obviously it's illegal to kill raptors in the UK, as it rightly should be. But uh, that does not stop them from doing it in clever ways to make it look like uh, uh, yeah. the, the uh, gamekeepers have not done it. Yeah. So, I and, I and actually, just to add to that, I remember hearing about a pigeon club in Bristol whose their pigeons, which are quite prized, were getting, racing pigeons, were getting hammered by the local peregrine falcons. And so mm. they, they developed a small mini explosive on the pigeon. On, and we're sending these up until the Bristol Council caught them, <laughs> putting explosive pigeons in the air. Uh, 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 yeah, there's some 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 length to go to. So when I knew you, I mean, I sorry, rather, I should say uh, in the past when I knew you, you were a rock climber and um, oh. then you had a corporate job. And now you're a professional full time cameraman and guide in Sweden. Uh for most people, that would be a unattainable, incredible dream to become a professional wildlife photographer. And I mean, most people have an interest in wildlife. I've even fantasized about it a multitude of times. And we'll go into the reasons for that, because I think it's one of the outside of maybe being a hunter or a fisherman. It's one of the only ways you can get so close to nature because you have to study it and be a part of it. And uh, how, what, what's the journey that got you to, to being a professional photographer? Yeah, it's a bit of an odd one, really. Um, I, like you say, when when I used to know you, which feels like about fifteen lifetimes ago, you know, uh, my my world was just about climbing. Um, yeah, it's every pretty much everything I did was was linked to climbing in some way or other, um, and I, I I managed to injure myself. I, I went to. Um, 
I mean, I was that story in itself. Yeah, I was at home. I was living at home with my mom and dad, um, and there was a, a really big climbing name in the UK at the time. This guy called John Dunn, who was like a sort of larger than life character. And um, I remember being in my bedroom, and uh, my mum comes and knocks on the door, and she's like, "Oliver, I've got this guy, um, uh, this guy on the phone who wants to talk. He's called John Dunn." So I'm like, "Hey, <laughs> and it's, a wind time, up. Want- it's a wind up." I was I was an up and coming sort of youngish climber at the time. I sort of um, I, I that was maybe like twenty two. You're being and too then, modest. You were you were a uh, you were a um, in the British climbing team, and you were one of the best sport climbers in the country. Yeah, I, I mean, I was. Uh, yeah, just, Come on, you were ha- you were handy, my friend. Yeah, I was probably fairly handy, and uh, so I'm like, what? John Dunn's phoning me, so I take the phone, and it's like. Uh, hi Oliver, is, is is that you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, is that John? <laughs> and and he basically was invite. He was going on a um, he was going on a European road trip in a camper van, and um and he wanted to see if I wanted to come along. So I was like, yeah, 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 why not? So I I, I remember we spent two or three days driving across Europe to get into southern Germany. And um, I remember we rocked up at this crag. So John was this like really big, larger than life character. And I've always been little and slim. And um, after three days in this camper van, sort of driving all the time, and we, we probably looked pretty minging, we rocked up at this, um, this crag in the Franken Jura region of Germany. And it was really busy. And um, we, yeah, we probably looked really grotty. We'd not had a shower or anything in all that time. And, uh, we tried talking to these people at the crag, and they were they were they were pretty dismissive as of dismissive of us. And um, anyway, we then proceeded to um, we did every route on the crag, but without falling off. And um, by the time we'd finished the hardest route, I remember turning round, and the entire crag was deserted. It just everybody. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's by the by. Uh, I ended up injuring myself on that trip. I tore a finger tendon really badly, and I came back to the UK and I thought I- I'm going to have to sort of get a job. Really, you know, at this I don't think I'm going to be climbing on this finger for six months. So I better get myself a job. And I, you know, I'd finished. I'd done a degree. I'd finished a degree in microbiology before. I'd got a decent level degree, a two one. Um, but I was, I was applying for microbiology jobs to sort of try and take my career in that direction, but I couldn't find anything. I ended up doing a job in a call center for a year and I saw a job for uh, General Electric. Yeah, yeah, started working for General Electric. And I, I, as my finger got better, I sort of continued to climb, but my focus moved from everything just being 100% climbing. I got quite absorbed into this sort of corporate career and I moved from being an analyst to... Um, at the time, GE was very big into sort of Six Sigma and Jack Welsh and process improvement. And I, I got pulled in on that. Um, so I learned to be what they classed as a black belt and then a master black belt. And then I moved out of London for a while on a big acquisition program. And I'd just gone career focused, a little bit of climbing on the side. Um, and then, yeah, it was really weird. My I, I had this goal in my head that I wanted to be on this certain amount of money by the time I was 30. I wanted to be on a head of by this age, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I ended up being like, yeah, I think I was the youngest head of in um, G, G capital, this sort of UK side of G capital. And yeah. And I, I just become completely focused on career. I was like a completely different person to what I am now and what I had been when you knew me as well, probably um, just this career focused person. And um yeah, I ended up like as a head of, and then I moved from there. I went to O2 and I worked as head of service delivery, then head of process improvement. And then I moved from there to Morrison supermarket as they were looking to bring in sort of Six Sigma and process improvement there. And I was, and um, the Morrison supermarket in their head office. I mean, that was that was that was a, a tough environment. The UK retail trade is renowned as being pretty tough. And it was, yeah, it was a pretty just a toxic almost environment within their senior management team. And I started thinking, I, I don't want to be doing this until I retire. I thought, yeah, it was, it was great. I was earning good money. and But it was just, you know, you're spending time around people who are being paid to be somewhere they would not be um, otherwise. And I started thinking, there's, there's, got, there's got to be a bit more to life than, um, than that. And I'd sort of, I'd become a... Um, I'd become a real sort of keen amateur photographer. Um, 
and I was getting more and more into that. And it, it's funny. So th- there's a chunk here that I have missed, which is I'd sort of retired myself from the climbing world because I'd, um, I'd really badly injured my ankle, which is why I'd started getting really keen into photography. Um, and I, yeah, I, I got asked by the, um, uh, the person who did the annual reports for the business. They were they're starting to pull together the annual report. It's like a big document, big corporates have to do each year, which shows the company's performance, et cetera. And uh, she contacted me and said, oh, hi, Oliver, I understand, uh, uh, I understand you sort of, you, you're really into photography. Would you be willing to take a picture of um, the, the, the board, um, the sort of the non-exec board and the exec board and, I was sort of like, oh, well, yeah, what, what do you mean? She said, well, we need to have a sort of like a sort of professionally done picture of the board to go in the annual report. Um, and we were thinking of doing one sort of um, take over one of the supermarkets on a morning, um, sort of set it up as a studio and do this big group photograph. You know, would you be willing to do it? We usually use this pro photographer. Um and I sort of me has always been one who's been quite happy to jump out of my comfort zone for, yeah, I can black that. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So I had to borrow some studio flash equipment and I did a complete blag. I was up on these step ladders. We've got all these really important people from a corporate perspective stood there and I did these photographs. And anyway, they, they um, Morrison's was really happy with them. They went in the annual report and she said, so, yeah, how much do you want paying for that? I, was, oh, well, what I, love, I love that question after you've done it yes i, I just assumed I, w- I was just doing it as a yeah i wonder if i could pull this off and um i work for them anyway and i get paid well so you know and she says well no no the guy that we uh who usually does this for us charges us three thousand pounds so i was like and three thousand pounds is you know this is back in 2012 is you know it was it was a lot of money it's a nice so, camera yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I was, I, I didn't, I didn't get them to pay me that amount by any means, but um, uh, they paid me additionally. So it got me thinking. I was like, well, if I could, I've, yeah, there's, that, that's got to be the way to go. So I, I sort of planned for it, saved some money, um, and handed my notice in. They asked if I'd stay for another six months to do another project, which I did. And I left the corporate world in February 2014 to become a pro photographer. But I had absolutely no idea which way it was going to go. And that first year I was, you know, if anybody, I I put stuff out on social media and uh, loads of sort of left field jobs came in. So, I mean, I did a jobs for all no kitchens, photographing their sort of kitchens and showrooms. I was... There turns out there was a guy in Leeds who was importing um, different style, sort of old style light bulbs. So I photographed his entire catalogue <laughs> of about 900 different light bulbs and he wanted them. And I, I was doing it all on the fly. Um, I'd hired some cheap studio space. He wanted photographs of these light bulbs, um, just like a regular product shot but then them hanging in different fixtures and he wanted them turned on and he wanted no reflections in them. And it, it, it's quite actually incredibly hard to take those photographs. So the inner geek side of me got really into working out, well, how can I photograph these light bulbs, but with no reflections, et cetera. And it was, yeah, and it was weeks worth of work. So sort I of sat in a studio fiddling around with camera equipment and just learning it all on the fly. Cause I'd got no, I had no training in photography. I hadn't done a degree in photography. It was all just, going to photography shop, asking these experts, getting tidbits of information, going back to the studio, tweaking things. Um, what, I had really good fun. What was your um, first what was your first wildlife photo? I, well, yeah, my first wildlife photograph, which sort of went big, I think it's actually on the head of my Twitter feed. And it's four kingfishers sat together. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I looked at that. I had a bit of a um I was about to say a blonde moment, but uh and noting my wife is blonde. And she's actually the smart one in the family. So I'm not trying to be in politically incorrect there. But I looked at that and I thought, wow, I didn't know that kingfishers flocked. And then I realized that's got to be a mum with, with, with babies. It's right? a dad. With chicks. It's a dad. A dad. With, yeah, it's, oh, it's, wow, uh, the, the males mo- feed, feed them, do they? Yeah, yeah. The, the, well, he's not feeding them. He was actually teaching them to dive. Um, oh, wow. Even more but I was actually, I wasn't there to photograph kingfishers. I was just actually out walking the dog. Um I'm just moving your, I'm just moving, I'm going to pull the image up, full screen. So for those people who are listening to this as purely audio, it's uh, four kingfishers 
three with their backs to the camera and the uh, fourth one at the top of the branch facing the camera and then the bigger male kingfisher in the middle looks like it's uh, <laughs> i don't know it probably looks like i do with my two sons when they're uh, when i'm trying to teach them something you know <laughs> uh, but it it's, was, uh, it, it's an incredible shot it was it was such a lucky photograph though i was just out walking a dog and i had a camera in the backpack and um there's there's a site near me called Fairbanings, and there's a there's a screen which goes over this dike. And I've just thought, I'll just have a look through there as I walk past with the dog. And there was four kingfishers. I'm like, what the? It's 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 really rare though, because as you said, kingfishers are not a community species at all. They're very independent, they're very territorial. Um, but once the, the parents have had their young, when the young fledge, they, 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 the parents will keep them around for about two days um, teach them the sort of key lifestyle things of fishing, et cetera, and then chase them off. So you've, you've mm. got to be really lucky to drop on, drop on that. Um, uh, and they nest in, in banks, don't they? They nest in they do, yeah. sandy yeah, banks. Yeah. So with the, with the absence of banks because of development, they actually, they get uh, very um, pressured in finding breeding areas. Yeah, they're, they're actually there's more kingfishers about than than I realised anyway. Um, I actually know where there's quite a lot of kingfishers quite close to me around here. Again, that goes back to that which we may talk about later about just local wildlife. And actually, that certainly for me in this area, I've I've discovered much more local wildlife than I ever knew existed. Um, it is there. It is under pressure. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things are not under pressure. But, um, you know, I didn't realise how many barn owls, tawny owls, et cetera, kingfishers um, were about. Um, it's just you don't see them. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you've you started an interesting point there, which is really you have to be taking time to see them as well. Absolutely, right? yeah. You, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Ha you have to slow down to the pace of nature to actually experience the multitude of species in nature so yeah. where where we live here in bali we um we live in a mostly open house our bedrooms are all enclosed but our sitting room living room area kitchen and everything is it's wide open it's pillared because the temperature here is always warm and pleasant and we get a beautiful breeze coming in off the ocean which is just a mile away and there's nothing between my property and the ocean apart from rice paddy fields yeah now um, what that means is that I will often sit in one of the armchairs just facing out into a garden that is surrounded by native trees and rice paddy fields. And when when you when you uh, first get to Bali, it feels like it's a little bit devoid of wildlife. And I've actually claimed that the rice paddy fields are devoid of wildlife. They are in many ways because there's a, a lot of in, um, of agricultural pollution I call, I call it pollution. Other people call it fertilizer and herbicide and pesticide. Um, mm -hmm. So there's not a great deal of insects there because it's a monoculture. But everything around the fringes and around the edges, the equivalent of a British hedgerow, where there's just small clumpings of native trees and plants, those areas, if you go over to them and you actually sit and you spend a bit of time, or like I do in my armchair, just looking out at the hedgerow around the edge of our garden... It is a non-stop whirlwind of activity. Yeah. And and yeah. the reason I mentioned my, we have a big swimming pool in our backyard, as do almost all of the houses here in Bali. Um, and we get kingfishers in our tree above that swimming pool. And they're local kingfishers. And they are very, very, very similar to the European kingfisher that we're looking at here, or the British is that a European kingfisher or is it just British? Yeah, it's European. It's European, yeah. yeah. So they're very similar to them, very, very similar. But they sit above a swimming pool. And I think they're sitting there waiting for something that's never going to happen, which is a fish to go swimming by. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's uh, it, it requires a real slowing down. And I'm more than happy to sit there for half an hour with my binoculars, just yeah. uh, absorbing what's going on. But 
I don't know anyone else who does it. I try to get my kids to do it, and they're just not interested. They want to go skateboarding or play on computers. Or yeah, computers. you're either not interested at that point in your life. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same for me. I mean, I could, yeah, we're of a similar age anyway, aren't we? Because we were both climbing at the same time. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I will go to places now which I just used to go steaming through and I've got this I have this little three-legged stool that I have on the side of my camera bag and yeah because a lot of the photography I do now is of macro subjects um, and I'll just pop that stool down and sit next to one of these like a border to a field and it, it's almost like they're like little oasises you know the fields like you say are devoid of wildlife and insect life because of the way they're treated but these little clumps at the side will absolutely be teeming with um, with wildlife, but you won't see it because you know you just you just walking past. But I pull out a little three legged stool and it's it, it's there. Um, I think I think it's one of the greatest shames of maybe even human history. Well, no, the greatest shame is the way we've destroyed the natural world and that where we've just completely just bulldozed over it and polluted it and assumed that it is this. Uh, resource just for uh, uh, available for you know our progress but uh, another huge shame for me is that these things mobile phones smartphones which i hesitate to use the word smart have given us such a myopia so we're so focused on what is immediately in front of us at the expense and the and i think the long-term harm to our senses of the natural world around us that we've evolved in for obviously hundreds of thousands well millions of years from day dot and i see it with my own kids where i'm i actually will ask them hey how many bird songs can you hear now and they just look at me like what uh there's that one in the background we can hear that one i'm like no there's six right now six different bird songs i can hear no dad there's a you know it's just that really loud one so just wait because the bird songs aren't continuous you have to listen between the gaps you know and and eventually they they might they might hear two or three but of course i grew up as a child in a council estate and my my place of solace and re respite from the from the vicious world was uh, a small woodland called the malago in bristol which is just down you know the back of my house which to me was a savior and you, you learn to refine your senses bird watching and animal watching and um, and I know you, as a professional animal, wildlife photographer, you have to do that, right? You have to be yeah, patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, yeah. uh, tell us, because I'm, you know, I'm speaking on your behalf there. What are the the qualities that you have to develop to be able to take good photos in 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 and amongst nature? You know, I mean, you have to learn how to find things. I mean, that is that that that's a key one. So I almost want to take a step back as well, though, Mike, in terms of you know, mobile phones, because I agree with you, they are a, they are a horrible thing. Um, I, I remember being in northern Sweden and I've just been out skiing in a whole frosted forest um, and it was absolutely amazing. Didn't see anybody at all. It's very close to a big hotel. And I remember then getting to the hotel to going for lunch and there being about 100 school kids all sat in the lobby of this this hotel which is 100 meters away from this forest and they were all glued to the phones like this i'm like thinking what why are you sat in here looking at your phones you should be out just walking in that forest but on the other side this thing has taught me so much about bird song um because you know there's fantastic apps on there where i can hear every local bird and what they sound like and it's really helped me develop how i can spot bird songs and then find birds and then photograph them. Uh, likewise, you know, the sky guide where it, um, it uses the clever stuff in here and you can look at the sky and see all the star constellations. And I've learned so much more about star constellations using that app on the phone. So, oh, you know, checking, I'm, I'm at a spot in Northern Scandinavia, it's cloud locked. I look on here, look at the windy app. I can see the cloud cover. Right, if we drive 50k that way, we're going to get to clear skies. Boom. So they are an evil thing. And people, you know, it's easy to use them for stuff which stops you from doing things. But then on the other side, used wisely, it's an absolutely fantastic tool. Um, so there's good and there's bad with smartphones, I think. Yeah, yeah so don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I have those astrology apps 
Um, uh, and I also have two, I have eye nature, I think it's called, which tells me every plant on our farm. Cause I, yeah. I haven't got the faintest idea what any of them are and also the insects. And, uh, and that side of it is absolutely incredible. Look, we're, I wouldn't be speaking to you now if it wasn't for trolling through yeah, Twitter yeah, looking yeah. for images. My issue is that they become a, they, we become their tool, not the other way around. Uh, yeah. 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 You know, uh, and, yeah. And the sadness to me is when people are more interested. And look, this is a complete bias and it's a complete opinion as somebody who is a, uh, who is a nature file. All I ever want to be doing is spending time in nature. It's one of the reasons I've been compelled to live um, in Bali here. But yeah, it's, it's the, uh, the devolution of the senses that concerns me for my kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they just don't have that same connection to nature. Because they no. have stimulation all of the time that they, if we allow them access to it. And actually, we have a bit of a reputation as strict parents because we only let our kids have an hour of screen time a day. Most <laughs> of their friends have unfettered screen time. So back to my question, though, on because it's linked to this, you know, the senses. Mm -hmm. You have to have attuned senses when you're out in nature and you have to have patience you have to be able to move slowly i would imagine uh, like so very different to a photographer if you're a studio photographer i would imagine you have to have a certain skill set to be a wildlife yeah photographer. I, I i would say the most important thing and it's and it's a whole raft of different skills but it's just finding the subjects and then once you can find the subjects because the actual sort of people get obsessed with settings on cameras and I think it's much more about finding the subjects. And once you've found them, um, it's then how how do you interact with them? Because if you interact with the subject in the wrong way, and it doesn't matter whether this is a dragonfly or whether it's a rare bird or whatever, you know, you interact with it incorrectly and it's going to disappear. And it, it might disappear for 10 minutes or it might disappear forever and never come back to that site. So... You know, you've got a bit of find the subjects, then you've got to be able to interact with them in a way which does not disturb them or minimizes a disturbance. And then you've got to think about what type of photograph you want to create, because a lot of people just sort of get there and, you know, they'll get to a site, see a kingfisher, pick their camera up and walk towards it. And the kingfisher goes, yeah. and they hadn't really put any thought into what type of photograph they were going to get anyway and therefore they've just got a generic so yeah you've got a bit of fine subjects you've got to learn how to interact with them and then you have to think about this in my view what type of photograph do you want to create it's not just a case of picking up a camera and pointing it at the subject uh, qu quite often it's it's yeah when, when i'm working in northern sweden um it's not so much wildlife photography because there is wildlife there, but it's, you're there in winter time and there's not much of it about. It's really hard to find. But um, the focus tends to be more on landscape photography. And I run these landscape photography workshops by this company called Lights of Lapland. And I'll take people out to this site. And it just it happens so many times. This, You know, you park up the van. Um, you're there in winter, so it could be minus 10, it could be minus 20, it could be minus 30, it can be pretty cold, that's centigrade. Um, and, you know, you walk from the van, a lot of the areas we go are on this frozen lake, Lake Tornatresk. You're walking through these frost-covered trees, it's deep snow, it's just stunningly beautiful. And, you know, there's these cliffs with all these wild ice formations on them, there's the big frozen expanse, there's these mountains, there's this whole raft of different things you could photograph. And I walk people out there and I haven't even got the sort of camera out of the bag. And people will be like, Oliver, what setting should I use? And I'm like, guys, just let's let's just have a look about, have a you know, look at all the beautiful things and have a think about what you want to photograph. Because until you've had a think about what you want to photograph, there's no, you know, settings, settings are irrelevant. I wouldn't even get the camera out of your bag to start with, just start soaking it in what do you see which is you think is the most beautiful thing and then think about how you want to photograph that and and then think about settings but yeah there's a thing with photographers where they are they are obsessed with settings um well for me i, I you know 
I, I want to sort of absorb a place to a degree before I start taking pictures of it. I, I, it's, it's quite hard to sort of put into words. I, I, when I first, yeah, because people do think of me as a wildlife photographer or a macro photographer, um, but I do, I do spend a lot of time doing landscape photography, especially when I'm up in up in Abisko. Um, but I remember when I first got into it, and I would we used I used to use this website called Flickr, which is still a thing, but it's not as much of a thing as it used to be. Instagram killed it. Yeah, Instagram killed it. Um, but back in the day, when I was sort of learning how to use my camera, Flickr Flickr was what it was all about, and I had a Flickr account, and I would. I would sort of think, right, you know, I'm not working this weekend. I want to go photograph waterfalls in Yorkshire. So I'd look on Flickr, put waterfalls in Yorkshire. Um, I'd find a really nice waterfall, uh, see some pictures of it, work out where it was, uh, drive up into the Yorkshire Dales, you know, get there early on the morning, get out of the car, get to the waterfall. I'd put my tripod up and I'd just put it up to a comfortable height, put the camera on, take about 500 photographs of the waterfall from the same position. And because I'd put my tripod up and I just put it to a height that was comfortable, my composition was entirely fixed already. And I would come away with like 500 pictures, which were pretty much all the same. Now, if I go to the <laughs> same Sounds like my photography. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to the waterfall and, you know, I'll put my camera bag down and I'll just leave it in one spot. And, you know, I'll have a look around the waterfall and I'll have my head up, I'll have my head down, I'll just sort of try to absorb it. And, yeah, unless there's some critical light event happening, which can be, you know, can be fast, um, you know, you just, I, I have to get a feeling of the place first. Yeah, it's... Um... So I, I'm going to share the screen so that you can see what <laughs> i've been on I've, twitter for years <laughs> i think i i've been on twitter for years and i actually got a whole bunch of followers when my first book came out in 2016 but and i just had this overwhelming sense of how does anyone say anything useful in however many characters is it 150 characters or something um yeah it's not many you you, you learn to be more concise that's for sure <laughs> i found it for me it was just too trite i couldn't I couldn't get across and because I don't I'm not interested in engaging in political debates or or the likes but uh, I am about to start reigniting my Twitter account um but for you with your imagery I can see why uh you would use it because to be able to share a lot of this stuff uh, to people yeah, all over the world Twitter is great to get me work out for sure so can you see the screen right now I'm in your Twitter account yep 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 Right, this is the image, and for those people listening just on audio, uh, this is the image that um, caught my attention and then uh, made me realise that I knew the photographer behind it. It Actually, do you want to describe it, Oliver, seeing it's your image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, uh, Well, the first thing is probably the colour of the image. So it's, it's an image of a wren, um, which is, as Mike said, one of the UK's smallest birds. Um, and it's it's sort of it's all a golden colour, um, and that's because it's taken first thing in the morning, just as the sun's coming over the horizon, and the wren is sort of clearly facing one direction, and it's it it, it it's backlit, so I'm looking at the wren there, um, but the sun is behind it, just coming over the horizon, so you've got that golden light, and it's it's sat in a gorse bush. Um, and you've got such, the bit which it sat on is in focus. You've got some out of focus gorse as well at the uh, left hand side of the image. And there's also some spider webs coming off the gorse, which you can see a little bit more clearly because they've got dew on them. And each bit of that dew is is also refracting that 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 sun just is coming over the horizon. But the, the key bit with the wren is it's a male wren and it's singing. This is springtime and he's singing to try and attract a female. Um, and as he's singing, I think it was um, eight degrees um, centigrade, or oh, no, six degrees centigrade. It had to be below eight degrees centigrade. Um, and below eight degrees centigrade, when he sings, his, uh, the, the water vapor, which is in his breath, um, condenses as he sings. And then you can see the sunlight refracted in those, in those minute water drops in, in the wren's breath. So um, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a big project to do. Um, it took me three weeks there or thereabouts to to get that photograph. Um, so I read I read on your website Oliver Wright Photography. I read the blog. Yes, how yeah. you got the image, and 
you've got 38.2 thousand likes on this image right now yeah yeah um, yeah i mean that, that tweet's had over three million views it's 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 been seen a lot that picture <laughs> yeah i'm surprised it doesn't have a lot more than 38 thousand because it it i think even the most naive observer of an image like this would realize that it's the kind of shot that either requires a huge amount of commitment and talent or just a very very lucky moment in time but i don't really believe in luck in in this type of situation um there's a there's a story behind it do you want to uh, uh tell people who yeah, are sure, yeah. To yeah, yeah. on your blog yeah because yeah, this was this was um this was a project i sort of yeah i had i'd had the vision of the photograph um, and well, why did you have the where did the vision come from for the photo just from seeing the wren um not in these specific conditions so i had seen photographs of a uh, bird's breath before you know it's uh, it's not a common photograph by any means because it, it is very specific conditions to be able to see a bird's breath um but i had seen photographs of bird's breath before and i'd sort of thought oh yeah I'd, I'd, yeah I'd, I'd really i'd really like to be able to photograph a bird's breath at some point but you know back to what we were saying before and you know it's obviously we still have birds in the uk but we don't have birds everywhere because because we've the landscape is 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 not what it was you know and if i'm looking at my back garden now um just off to to my left you know i do get birds in that back garden but i do not have a clear view to the uh to the east which is what you need so basically to get a photograph of a bird's breath you need you need sort of the bird in front of you and you need access to the eastern horizon. So as the sun's just coming over the horizon, it, it sort of captures, you know, it backlights the bird's breath. So just as a, I need a bit of preamble on that. So basically uh, March last year, my my poor old dog that I'd had for 14 years, she, uh, she passed away and, um, and it was it was a pretty tough time because it, it was sort of still part of sort of UK lockdown. Um, I'd, and yeah, obviously I've been spending a lot of time with the dog and I'd had her for 14 years. She was an amazing dog um, and she sort of she passed away, but she was 14. She was she was a big old dog. She was um, a Bouvier des Flanders. And in the last six months, she'd not really been up for doing anything like a big walk. Um, and quite a lot of my early morning photography was sort of done with the dog. Me and the dog would go out sort of just before sunrise. She would have a walk. I would do some macro photography, blah, blah, blah. And she hadn't been up for doing any early morning walks at all. And I hadn't wanted to sort of, you know, there'd been 14 years of me grabbing a camera bag on the morning, the dog getting very excited. So I hadn't, I'd basically not done any early morning photography because I didn't want the dog to get excited and then not be able to go out and do the walk and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, the dog had passed. Um, I was pretty upset, but I thought I'm going to sort of jump back into doing early morning photography because, you know, the, that, that's what I should be doing. And I'd heard of... Um, there was a rare bird at a local site, uh, the name of which has dropped Agreed. out. Right? A grebe. Yeah, Slavonian grebe. Yeah. Slavonian. So there have been reports of this Slavonian grebe at St. Aidan's, and I had sort of seen on the map where it was. It was about a, about a mile and a half walked from where you can park the car. So I got my, um, I've got a, a big 800 mil lens, um, stuck that in a backpack, drove to St. Aidan's, walked to this site, and it was really easy to uh to find i basically well i didn't know that it was going to be easy to find i walked to this spot um there was a slavonian grebe i got the camera out of the bag yeah there's a slavonian grebe and i photographed it it was really really easy um and i was like yeah that was about the easiest rare bird i've ever photographed um i mean it's 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 a nice photograph but it's sort of just you know a generic photograph of a rare bird and i sort of yeah, got there, done it, got the photograph, started walking back. And as I was walking back towards the car, there's a very long, straight section um, with gorse bushes on either side. And you, you have got a view to the west and you've got a view to the east. And as I was walking up, there was this male wren. Yeah, there he is, um, flitting about these gorse bushes and singing his, singing his mouth off. And um, 
I hadn't realised that wrens actually have, because it was, it, like you said before, Mike, they're a tiny bird, um, but they have a really loud and very distinct song. Um, and they've actually, male wrens have got specifically designed lungs. Their lungs are different to uh, any other small birds. So they can sing so loud. Um, so I'm watching this and I'm looking at the sort of the profile and it's, sort of, it's a big flat area off to the east. And I was like, crikey. If I got everything sort of specifically right, I wonder if I could see that wren's breath. So me being me, I am like a dog with a bone on these things. Just kept on looking at the forecast, back to the use of smartphones again. Um, on an evening, um, oh yeah, tomorrow it's going to be too windy. Yeah, tomorrow it's going to be 11 degrees. It's going to be too warm. Yeah, you know, I've done a little bit of research, you know, what are the perfect conditions for being able to see a bird's breath. So that's where I realised it, it was ideally it needed to be where well, it needed to be below eight degrees you wanted as little wind as possible and you wanted no clouds off to the east so um basically every morning where it looked like the weather conditions were right i would drive to st aidan's do the mile and a half walk in um, and go look for this rent and that's that's the other piece as, as well as um as well as having those specific conditions, you need an obliging animal. And this male wren was very obliging. You know, he was, he was, he was there every single morning I went, he was there. So um, <clears throat> I can't remember how many times, I, I think it was about 10 times in that, in that three week period, I would go down because the weather conditions look right. Um, so you're probably thinking, well, why is it taking 10 times? It sounded easy. Um, every time I got there, the wren was on the wrong side of the path. So the sun would be coming up and you only have a very small window of time where you've got that golden light um, and you'd be able to see the breath. Um, but the wren would be on the wrong side of the path. So I, I've got it, you know, it was, it, it'd be there in perfect light. Um, but the wrong light to be able to see the bird's breath. And I, I remember sort of, I'd be watching him and you, you could be stood really close to him. You could be stood within about four metres. It really wasn't bothered, this bird. In fact, I did some other, I did some other wacky stuff where I was videoing the bird with extension tubes on. And it, I mean, it's a great place, great place to be anyway, because as you show in this screw down. Oh, what, what's, what's an extension tube, just for people like ah, me yeah. who haven't got the Sorry, faintest yeah. idea? An, <laughs> an extension tube is something you put on um, between your lens and the camera, which allows you to use the lens within the minimum focusing distance of that lens. So it means you can get closer to the subject and the subject will be more magnified in the pictures. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Absolutely. So I, I did some I just, yeah, daft things of uh, videoing um, a wren singing with extension tubes on, so it was like creating almost like a magnified image of a wren. I mean, is you that, can see the that, wren there. Is that what we're looking at here? This, there's a an incredible shot in front of us of those people listening of the wren side on and then front on. <laughs> you can see all the way into yeah, the, vo yeah, the so, void of yeah. its mouth. Yeah. You, uh, so, um, there's, I did some work. I'm not even sure where it is. I, I do too much work and don't document it well enough. Yeah, it's not It's not even on here, but I did some, you can see these barbs in the wren's mouth. <laughs> um, Look at that. Yeah, it's probably and somewhere. They, they, and you're right, they do. Actually, I, I put a video together a few months ago, a brand video for our company. Uh, it's called No Trash on Earth. No trash on Mars, sorry. And um, I was looking for a bird song to play over the shift in scenes, showing mm -hmm. the uh, yeah, essentially showing the contrast between Mars and and planet Earth. And I listened to all these bird songs, and then I hit the wren, and it was so compelling. Mm. It, ju it just it has a. It, uh, it's a shame we can't just pull it up and play it now because it has such a um how do i it's hard to put it into words but it, it sort of feels like the call of nature yeah um, absolutely absolutely uh, and the fact uh, that coming from such a small bird no uh, but i yeah i mean i i was begging this wren to go from the left side of the path to the right side of the path <laughs> how do you, I, how I, do you I, beg a wren yeah, i was literally <laughs> Please, Ren, please, please move from that side to that side. And because the first morning I'd seen it, it had been on the right-hand side of the path. So I was assuming 
I was going to go down there on the first morning, the sun was going to come up and I was going to get this type of image, but that was not the case. Uh, I just had to keep going down and going down. And then one morning I was down there, I was all set up, um, camera on a tripod, et cetera, et cetera. Wren's on that side, sun's coming over the horizon, light's absolutely perfect. It's still staying on the left side of the path. I'm begging the Wren, please, please fly that side. And the wren flew up the path and then it went over onto the correct side of the path. So I thought, I thought I've got to get there really quickly because I've only got a couple more minutes of this, uh, this light happening. But the wren's about 50 metres away. So I pick everything up. I sort of run towards it. And then once I get within 10 metres, slowly move and get myself positioned. And then, and to start with, I, I'm sort of, I thought I was there and I couldn't see the breath. And I'm sort of like, oh, no, all this effort. And I still can't see the breath. And then I just moved a few centimetres and woof, I could see the breath. So then that's when I got this uh, this sequence of photographs. Um, but the, it, funnily enough, the wren never quite, like in that photograph there, which I think is, is that's the, that is my favourite one out of them. Um it still wasn't, um, it never quite sort of was 90 degrees to the camera. It was always sort of a little bit further off. Um, so I thought, I, I really, I really want to get some more footage. So I think I put another two weeks into it, um, going there every morning where it would work. And then I, I managed to see it again, but this time it did face much more onto the camera, um, which, and I, I thought that's what I was after, but actually the um, that image, which is there from the first time I saw it ended up being my favorite, but it was quite an emotional thing because, you know, the dog had passed away. Um, I was going through this grieving process. I got this project of photographing a wren's breath and almost sort of seeing the breath come out and it disperse. I don't know, it, it gave me it gave me closure on the dog passing away. I know that sounds utterly ridiculous, but it really did. And it it really does give me a, I've got goosebumps now thinking about it. It was it, it was, you know, it was it was a difficult period of my life with the dog passing away. And um yeah, I sort of got this project, put a load of time into it, and it was it was quite it was quite emotional. Um I, I, I'm on your blog page for those people just listening again on audio and the the images at the end of Ren's breath and then you've written in your blog watching the breath come out of the bird and hearing that song was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life I've learned a few things from this time March was a tough month but April has been much better a dog really is a person's best friend it really is possible to see a Ren's breath and there is so much satisfaction in being able to visualize a photograph put the effort in and realize it and lastly early mornings really are a special time of the day you you in the subtext there you raise a point that for me is incredibly important and that's the comfort that you can find in nature i mean i know mm -hmm. i have a couple of very close friends who went through bouts of doing depression i say doing rather than having um, but that's uh, that's another debate in itself. But doing depression and um, and figuring out inadvertently through desperation that moving back into nature and being close to nature had a profound healing effect. And I think there's a there's multiple elements to that. Maybe the unseen from an electromagnetic. Uh, frequency perspective i don't mean woo woo stuff i mean there is a very big difference between the, the emf fields in a city versus in a forest in a mountain and in, in the ocean um i think uh, there's evidence there's some research on uh, tree pheromones and the effects that they have on us but for me it's more about something like this image which is perspective when you see a bird as beautiful as a wren making a sound that that is is uh, just almost unfeasibly unfeasibly um, loud for an animal of that size and then capturing a moment like this with the breath for me that is beauty and it's magical and you know i don't have any intention of going to mars with elon musk i'm obsessed by this world that we're on and it's one of the things that i said to you yesterday on our pre-call that for me to have somebody like you on is actually it's not just about talking about the photography it's about the effect that you can have on other people and where you can share the beauty of nature and you can share the magic of it and more importantly for me at least and it's the reason i do this podcast 
is hopefully to elicit in people a sense of awe and a sense of wonder but most importantly a sense of if not love then certainly appreciation for nature because without that appreciation and hopefully love um you're not going to work to protect it if you uh, absolutely absolutely if I, if I you know if i relate this back to you saying to me how did you become a wildlife photographer and i mentioned about me and my corporate career in my 30s you know, back then when my goals were, I want to be earning this amount of money by the time I'm 30, I didn't give a rat's behind about nature. Well, I did. I have always been, I've always had an interest in it, but I was very divorced away from it at that period in my life. Um, while now, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I earn a fraction of what I used to earn. And I don't care, you know, I'm, I, I'm much more interested you know, at the moment. I'm planning some wilderness hikes that I'm going to be doing in, in, in the Abisko region. And that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm interested in. I'm, you know, I'm interested in immersing myself in, in nature. Um, two, two questions. Well, one's a segue because I was about to ask you where we go next on your portfolio here, but I'm going to open up Abisko region because you mentioned it, but before you do, so uh, you said that it took two you you added another or committed another two weeks to getting the correct photo of the wren mm -hmm. now um two weeks for me is longer than any holiday i've had in the last 10 years uh, off of work um the yeah. the idea of being able to walk into an, a natural area for two weeks day in day i mean each day going after something as singularly simple as the a photo of a bird that just sounds like another world for me because i work six days a week and uh, you know you can catch me yeah. at 6 a.m and probably midnight as well um how does how how does it work from a from the perspective of professional photographer do you sell that image of the wren there has to um, obviously yeah. you have to pay the bills so yeah 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 there's uh there's there's a multitude of elements and there's something else i want to come back to on the uh, wren's breakfast well um but it's it's only a portion of the day though so i'm getting up before the sun's risen i'm walking in i'm with mr wren for maybe about an hour maybe a bit less and then i'm packing up and i'm walking back out um and interestingly that is an area where a lot of photographers go i was very well i wasn't really ever but i was very rarely seeing anybody at the time i was doing the photography of a wren's breath as I was walking out, you'd have a few photographers starting to walk into that area. Um, and then I'd go home and then I could be doing other things as well. So I'd generally be home by 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, if your standard working hours say between 8 and 6, it wasn't really having any impact on that. So, you know, and, and a lot of the photography I do, I mean, in the summertime, my alarm is set for 4.30 because then you know i'm getting to the, the sunrise is really early here in the uk at that time um i'll go and do my sort of macro photography um and then and then i'll be, i'll often be home by 7 a.m so that that element of creating new material is often before the start of the working day and the traditional working day anyway so um so i could still be doing other work um, so, you know, I'm, I may come back and I might do a sort of a virtual talk for Canon on Facebook Live, you know, during the day anyway. So that would be providing me some income as well. So, but, but, you know, I, I, I live on my own. So, you know, I'm not having to support a family like yourself, Mike. So we probably have different um, drivers from, from that perspective. But being able to... Um, concentrate a load of work in the winter as well when I do my guiding work and I'll be leading a group of tourists one week and then another group the next week and another group the week after that 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 is sort of a large portion of my yearly income so during the summertime so my yearly income that is very much fluctuates throughout the year so some some months will be good months and not you know, it's not the other months are bad months but you know I've already planned that I'm not going to be generating as much income during that during that part part of the year anyway. Are there are there any wildlife photographers who are stinking rich from their trade? 
Um, yeah, there's some who have done uh, very, very well. Um, I, like I say, um, I'm, I'm not as goal oriented as I used to be. So, I, you know, I don't have any aspirations of becoming stinking rich anymore. <laughs> so, um, I, and the reason the reason I ask is simply because, and it's something I'm going to ask anyway of you. Um, well, I'm going to do it now on the podcast, but I'd like to buy some of these images from you to have printed certainly to put in our office we've been waiting to figure out what it is we're going to put in our office on the walls and um i think i mean i've been to an, a many many galleries in my lifetime and, and a multitude of which have incredible photos in very well put together frames with price tags of many thousands even tens of thousands of of uh, i was about to say dollars but you're english so pounds and um, I'm really surprised that you're not selling these images in galleries around the world. Yeah, or, I think I have, I have not. I have not invested any time into trying to do it. Um, I mean, this is my second website. My first website did have a sort of commercial angle to it, and that you know you could buy images from there, and if somebody clicked on it, it would generate a form, and that form would blah blah blah. blah. And I, I just I wasn't. I, I wasn't getting enough volume through that. You know, it was only a trickle of volume. Um, so when I set up the second website, um, it was just a cheaper option. To uh, yeah, I was I was only going to set so much money into the website, and I thought I would invest that money in just trying to have the website show the images at their best, as opposed to that commercial side of it. And I thought, well, if anybody really does want to buy a, an image, they, they'll contact me, which is what happens. Um, so yeah, you know, of course, I if people want to buy images, I, I will sell images. Um, but that I don't know. I think that side of the market has somewhat changed. I mean, there was that whole NFT craze that was going bonkers last year, um, but I didn't jump onto that for one reason and another. I was sort of I don't know. I thought it looked a bit ugly. Um, oh, it's still so going, it's still going bonkers. It's just that people are getting their asses kicked on anything in relation to crypto i i believe yeah 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 um so we're you mentioned abisco region and i've clicked on that part of your portfolio and so yeah for, that, uh, that was part of the um going back to 2014 when i'd sort of set myself up as a pro photographer i still i wasn't really doing it in the nature side of things i had had for, and yeah this is a funny funny discussion actually because i had had um two pro photographer friends of mine who had contacted me once they'd found out I'd, you know, left the corporate world and set myself up as a pro photographer. And um, both of them had exactly the same message, which was, um, yeah, great that you've done it. I'm sure you'll make it work, but you, you know, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to drop away from photographing wildlife and insects because there's no commerciality in that. And I'd listened to both of them and sort of thought, yeah, great. You know, it's like, I appreciate you telling me what you think, but I'm still going to continue to photograph wildlife and insects because I really enjoy it. And a year after them having that conversation with me, I got an email off somebody from Canon saying, um, oh, we really love what you're doing with wildlife and insects. Would you be willing to start doing some work with us and doing talks for us? Um, and I did, and I'm sort of... as part of me which is very glad I didn't listen to the advice that those two people had given me saying that I needed to drop away from doing that type of photography um so are you sponsored by Canon no no I'm not sponsored by them but I just I'm sort of clustered as, as a, a trusted friend of Canon's so I do quite a lot of um talks at events so I've just been I was their main speaker at um the International Bird Fair two weeks ago so um that's a case of sort of going to the event. Canon have a big stand there. Um, they have a, you know, a giant screen set up and you stand there at schedule times and do talks. I did two talks a day. I did one on um, local wildlife and I did one about um, my last two months in Nabisco, last October, November. Um, so, I, so as somebody who knows almost next to nothing about photography and um, yeah. Believe it or not, I actually took photography at A level, but I only lasted three months at A level before I dropped out and then went climbing. And <laughs> um, and the reason I took photography was because the the photography teacher, I think his name was Jason, uh, the 
Bristol College, had recently been on Jonathan Ross. Right. And not because of his photography. Jonathan Ross used to have a show on it about 5 p.m., I think on Channel 4. And uh, he would have odd guests on. And this guy was on who collected sick bags from aeroplanes. Right. And the sick, <laughs> sick bags collection was, he had hundreds of these things from memory. But we went and did a tour in the college and we got taken into all the interesting stuff, not maths and not um uh not english and they showed us the labs and they showed us the the gym and they showed us i guess because they wanted us to come to the college this is when we were 16 i sort of semi dropped out of school already but um i remember going into the photography area and there was jason who'd just been on jonathan ross a week ago <laughs> and so starstruck as i was by this uh sick bag collector i, I signed up to do a level photography <laughs> and and you're like this because the first week um, I spent uh, 22 English pounds on buying a photographic paper, a whole stack of it, because we were doing our own developing of, you remember, those things called photos. Before mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I didn't know that it was light sensitive. So I pulled it out of the bag to look at the quality of it in the middle of the daytime. And obviously the whole lot was therefore ruined. And 22 pounds was a king's ransom to me. At that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, and, um, and yeah, I managed to get a hold of a secondhand camera and uh, my photography lasted for about a month before <laughs> I realized that I just don't have the eye for it. And I did probably didn't pick up a camera ever uh, again until I got an iPhone and yeah. started taking pictures and it's sad to say, but the majority of my pictures are of my kids. You know, I'm, I'm not sharing them in many places. It's but it's for me to have memories of my family. But yeah, I sure. just don't. I don't. I was actually going to ask you about the uh, question on our Canon the, the cameras to have if you're a wildlife photographer. But I think a more interesting question is actually what it how, how you develop the eye for images because I'm looking at your images and they're an alien world to me that to capture. I can. I can absolutely relate to being in the places and seeing the beauty and the in the moment. I do that every single day here in Bali. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to capture it in the way that you do, because it's not just press the shutter and grab the image. There, there, it's like you've interpreted the natural world into these images. And that's what a yeah. good photographer does. Uh, they interpret something for people like me who don't have the faintest idea how to do something like this. It is it is, it is a really interesting point because, and you, you, do hear, you do hear people sort of say, you've either got the eye or you haven't got the eye. I mean, I, I've, I don't know, have you heard people say that? I mean, you, oh, yeah, like you, yeah. I know yeah. I haven't. I absolutely know I haven't. And you do have people who have got an intuitive eye for sure. You know, if you if you give ten people a phone camera and a beautiful scene, you, you, you'll always get one or two people who manage to, you know, let's just assume these are all untrained photographers. There'll be one or two people who, when you look at the images afterwards, who who just produce something which just looks better to look at. And it, it it's I, I don't think I've got access to give you. I so when I first became a hobbyist photographer, um, you know, my images did not have any. They didn't have any compositional value as such. I was not in. I wasn't looking at a scene, and I wasn't thinking, right. I, I want this to look in that way. I would just be pointing a camera towards it and taking what, a picture. What does, sorry, oh, what does compositional value mean? Because I know what the two individual words mean but i don't really understand what that means from a, a yeah well if you take the first image that's on that page yeah which is a we, uh so we've got trees in the front that are in a kind of autumnal turning of the leaf color orangey brown and then there's a is it a, a fog or a mist yeah there's a temperature inversion so that the clouds are all sunk in the valley yeah um and then you've got that big U-shaped U-shaped mountain in the in the background, um, and so, a mountain coming in in between. So you've got foreground yeah. of the trees, then you've got the 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 mist, deep deep mist, heavy. Then you've got to the right of the image, you've got a forty-five degree mountain slope that comes in at another level. So you've got one, two, three layers, and then the fourth layer. 
actually then there's sort of wide open ground which is a fourth layer then you've got the fifth which is the mountains and the big u in them and then i guess you've got empty sky behind yeah so i mean it's hard to describe really so that, that's this is in the Abisko region. Um, I was there in autumn time, and all uh, their autumn's really early because, um, you know, you're 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, you're at 400 meters of altitude approximately in that region. Um, so their autumn colors come early, so generally around the 10th of September. And I was there in full, full autumn glory. This was getting towards the back end of it, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a photographer's playground. It's also it's a really brilliant time to be there because there's virtually nobody else about, or everything's in. It, that region has a, a very busy summer period where you know a lot of people are hiking in that region. A lot of people travel there for hiking, fishing, etc. And then it has a very busy winter period where you've got a lot of international tourists going to see the aurora, um, a lot of Swedish people going for skiing etc so it has this very distinct summer and winter period autumn um a, a lot of the locals just disappear because they use it as downtime and they'll go to thailand or whatever to get a whole lot of sun before they go back up there and work the winter period so anyway so i'm in i'm up there in at that period driving around taking whatever pictures so there's a big mist in the valley so there's um there's a ski area 10 kilometers away from where I live. And that's where I'd gone to visit here because it was missed where I was. I thought if I, if I, if I drive up to where that ski area is, um, it's the only place where you can actually drive up the mountains a little bit. Um, I thought I might get above the mist. So I get up there. So where I'm stood, where I'm taking that photograph, there's a whole load of ski lodges just below me. Um, I'm at the back of this hotel. They've got a load of building work going on because the hotel's um, shut and there's loads of building materials around me and the place looks an absolute tip. But when you look at that image, it's sort of a bit sort of, I don't know, it has a, almost like a Japanese um, picture painting style does, to it. Very much so, yeah. It does. I uh, think that's the mist, isn't it? And the trees. Uh, the mist, uh, what trees are, are they birch trees or...? Yeah, mountain birch trees. Um, and I photographed this with a very long fo focal length. Um, a very, you know, it's like a, a telephoto lens to make the mountain bigger in the background. So if I'd stood next to those trees with uh, my phone, which is like a wide angle, that U-shaped mountain would have been very small in the frame. But I thought if I walk further enough back, and use a long lens, I can get away from all this building material, which is in this car park. Um, and those trees will be of the right size against that mist. So the mist completely covers the top of the trees. And then that U shape is going to be able to come really big. So I've used, so most people, when they think of landscape photography, they're using wide angles to try and fit everything in. I didn't want to fit everything in because I've got loads of building materials around me and what have you. So I'm using a long lens to make the size of the mountain against the size of those trees very specific to avoid, like I say, if I'd have used a wide angle, you'd have been able to see the mountain chalets, which are just behind those trees, but the camera is very close to the floor. So I've used a whole load of different um, tricks. They're not tri well, I, they're not tricks as such because I haven't edited anything out. I mean, if I'd have edited chimneys out and stuff like that, that would be tricks in my eyes. But I've just used physical properties of the camera to give a unique perspective, which I couldn't I couldn't see with my eye, but I could see with my mind because I've spent long enough playing around with cameras mm. to understand that if I use um, this aperture everything's going to be out of focus in the background. Or if I use this focal length, it's going to change the perspective of things. Um, and so I, I, so I had that image in my mind. It's a bit like the, you know, walking out after photographing that Slavonian grebe and seeing the wren there and then thinking, actually, potentially, if I got there in this specific set of circumstances, 
I might be able to see a wren's breath. You know, it's a similar thing, um, except I didn't have to wait for a specific set of circumstances. I was there and it was it was all perfect. I just had to understand that if I used the camera in a specific way, I could create an image that was slightly, which was very different to what I could see with my eye. Because with my eye, I could see all of these chalets in front of those trees, just a bit lower down. There's loads of building materials across the car park I'm stood in. Um, so it's about understanding how the camera can work to create something different to what you can see with your eyes. But the, 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 there's a long journey to sort of get there, if you see what I mean. So one is, you know, if, if I jump back to if you're saying, so, you know, these all have, or where I said I didn't have any compositional value to the images I was creating. And by that, I was very much, you know, I would see a bird on a stick, I would photograph it, and it would be the bird sat in the middle of a stick. Likewise, I would go to this waterfall, I'd just get there, stick my tripod up, take an, take an image, and um, there would be the waterfall in the middle of the picture. I wasn't, I wasn't putting any thought into what would make a better or a worse picture, if that makes sense. And I had a, I had a, I had a moment. So I was, um, I was out walking. In fact, I, I was stood about 10 metres away from where I took those pictures of the kingfishers, uh, the four kingfishers together. I was out on a dog walk and this little robin um, came bobbing down. Like I say, there was, there was snow on the deck and this robin came sort of quite close to us. And I took a picture of this robin on the snow and I put it on the social media and it was getting so much more social media attention than all of the other photographs I used to take. And I sort of like, why is this picture getting so much more social media attention? Um, I, I haven't, it's not, on my, it's an old image. They say, I don't think it's not on my website. And I, I spoke to a friend of mine about it and he's like, well, it's because of the composition. I'm like, well, what do you mean? And there was the robin on the snow and it was quite a close up of a robin. And there was a, there was a sort of gray feather out of focus and there was a red feather out of focus and they sort of linked in with the robin, if that makes any sense. And just so compositionally, um, it, it made a lot more sense. And I sort of thought, I'm going to have to start thinking about my photographs a lot more. And so I thought, well, how could I, how could I understand what, um, what makes a better photograph? And I sort of thought to myself, what about if I go to um, the art gallery in Leeds and I just start looking at some of the sort of classic pictures in the art gallery? So I started looking at the pictures in the art gallery and I sort of thought, well, yeah, I'm looking at these pictures and they all they all do look brilliant. They are, you know, sort of, and those guys, when they're painting this picture, they have a license compositionally to do what they want. It's their... Uh, it's their picture. So I sort of started trying to think to myself, um, well, what looks good about that picture? What do I like about that picture? And what do I not like about that picture? Um, and I started tr just trying to understand what, what made the pictures look good. Does that make sense? It's hard to... It's you're, hard looking to for, you're looking you're looking for the patterns across the pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I, start, I started noticing, you know, a certain... You, you would never have you would never cut off a subject off the side of one of those pictures um oh that's a picture a friend of mine pete oh. walked in this year uh, i i think that's possibly the best wildlife shot i've seen this year i think i put that second on the second behind yeah. the rent that is an oh, incredible was, shot was, so what we're last year. <laughs> so um, we're, okay. we're looking at a um cuckoo bird a juvenile being fed by its adoptive meadow pipit parent. I wouldn't have known that was a meadow pipit with its head buried in the mouth. And yeah, uh, yeah. The, the cuckoo is, uh, it's got its mouth wide open, as greedy as they are. And yeah. the pipit has got its head almost the whole way in feeding it. Exhausted, probably, because... Uh, Absolutely exhausted, yeah. Cuckoos, they, um, they're kind of a parasitic bird in that they, the females lay their eggs in the nests of songbirds and then when the chick hatches the cuckoo chick which it typically does before the other um, songbirds hatch it then spreads its wings and it pushes all the eggs out doesn't it it so does it, yeah so yeah. it's the sole yeah. recipient of all of the attention of the songbird is there any case where cuckoos are reared by their own parents not that i know of no 
Nobody, no, no cuckoo bump, bucked the trend and decided to be a responsible parent. That is just what they do. You don't, hear they do. you don't hear them as much. When I was a kid, I would hear them in the local woods, the Malago Wood and a bunch of other places. And it's actually the, it's kind of the, um, a, a, the, the sense of summer is in the air when you're in a forest and you hear a cuckoo in the background. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was in Bulgaria in June and everywhere we went in Bulgaria, you could hear cuckoos. But yeah, compared to the UK, in fact, those images you're just flicking through now with Bulgaria. I, I, that, I can't. I, so I am flicking through your I, I encourage everyone listening here to go onto Oliver's Twitter account. Um, I'm actually flicking through all these insects, partly because I'm not as as compelled by the insects as I am by the birds being a bit of a you know or amateur ornithologist myself they are incredible photos but i'm looking for this i'm looking for this robin that you mentioned and seeing or would it just oh, be too far back it'll be too too far back would it? okay and, um, i can see if i can find it on my oh, twitter oh look at that bulgaria still delivering the goods what's that a moth yeah what? that's a humming, hummingbird hawk moth hummingbird hawk moth wings so we're looking at a a moth with its proboscis is that what that is? Uh, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is its long tongue sticking out and into a thistle flower. I think that yep. looks like. And um, the moth hawk, hummingbird hawk moth, which I've never seen before in my life, has a. I'm imagining that is a pl some kind of feather that makes it look like it's got an eye, so that it is puts off predators, or is that its eye? Um. Its eye is just below the antennae. So that is its eye, that big old eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is its eye. What? That's, <laughs> a, that's a, it almost looks um, feline. Like a that eye. eye. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like an insect eye. It looks like a, it looks like, I assume that was part of its plume, sort of feathery covering. You know how insects develop, obviously, uh, so types of um, patterns to put off predators. Um, but that's a real eye. That's a big, that's a real eye, yeah, yeah. yellowy eye with a, a rather large iris in it. I didn't know insects had eyes like that. It looks too uninsect. <laughs> that's a magnificent shot. Uh, do you? You obviously have to position on a tripod for that stuff, or are you running around? Uh, no, the that's, that's handheld. That's handheld. Um, horn viper. That's a, a snake I've wanted to see for a lot of years. Scroll back up. That looks more like yeah, a crocodile. Yeah. It look yeah. it doesn't actually look like a snake. If I I it if I saw this image without you saying it was a snake, I would assume that the bend down in its left shoulder area was actually shoulder shoulders and it that it had legs, because it looks like a lizard, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a big fat female horn viper. That's uh, Europe's most um venomous snake. Hmm. A friend of mine got um a friend's son. Well, the son's a friend, but he's 12 years old, got bitten by a viper only last week in his garden here oh. in Bali. He fell into a tree and there was a tree viper in it and it bit him. And um, the I've got photos of his hand. It's The hand swelled up like a bunch of sausages, went bright green within minutes. And they, and they rushed him to hospital. Um, and luckily, the treatment worked very well. But... Um, yeah, we're surrounded by snakes here. I get cobras in my back. Uh, regular. Cobras. Oh, look at that. Yeah, we get cobras, spitting cobras, and I don't know what the other one is, but the. Uh, um, and then there's a whole bunch of poisonous snakes here. So I saw these white legged damselflies today in Bulgaria. The female is ovi positioning her eggs into the pond, and the male, the blue one, is guarding. Not seeing them paired up in this way while the female lays her eggs. So it looks like a completely fake photo where you've created <laughs> plastic bugs and then wait the one on top is the male right um uh, yes yeah. yeah and he's just got this in human terms it would be about a 12 foot pole sticking out of its rear end into the back of the female How, he's not mating though is he there's no no, no, he's not. No, so they've they've already mated, and she is laying eggs. Yeah. Um. And yeah, he's just guarding basically. He's just guarding. Whilst whilst, whilst, re whilst relaxing on her shoulders. 
Or yeah, neck. yeah. Mul- multitasking. <laughs> My God, this this brings up a a real sense of naivety on my part somebody who actually probably spends way more time in nature and thinking about nature than the average person Uh, the average maybe person that lives in a city but even country folk don't really spend enough time looking at this level uh, the micro Uh, there's a there's another world going on isn't there in the insect world a whole other world that we're is just so small and out of our everyday view that it, we mostly ignore it unless you're getting bitten by a mosquito and then I don't ignore it. I go after them with a vengeance. But your photos here really elicit in me a sort of sense of of uh, naivety because I just have never seen insects, never been compelled by insects. So I've never really, you know, if there's a David Attenborough show and it's got insects in it, I'm probably looking away at something else. Um, I'm not freaked out by bugs. I, you know, I actually I have a a a, a deep loathing of mosquitoes um, <laughs> because I I get bitten by them every single day here in Bali. But these photos are absolutely incredible. That that to me I can't quite get my head around it. <laughs> the uh, yeah the damselflies uh, positioned on each other. The stuff that's going on out there in the insect world right now, you know, and we're not. Uh, I, I, you know, until I got into macro photography, I'm just trying to find that Robin for you. Um, I, I hadn't realised what goes on in the insect world, and it's it is it is one crazy, crazy world. Um, I'm going to give up looking for that Robin photograph. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. We yeah. can post. We can post. It. I tell you what, well, let's post it in the uh, show notes on the website so that people yeah. can see it there. The tiny sedge warbler sees off a much larger cuckoo in a slow motion filmed in the Canon R5. These, so um, Canon is the is the camera to be using for wildlife photography. If I wanted to get into wildlife ph- photography tomorrow, where do I start? How do I do this stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, people people are people go brand crazy. Um, and at the moment, Canon are definitely winning in the um, in the camera wars. Um, but yeah, whichever brand, I, you know, it, I, if I'm being honest, the reason I use Canon is just due to the fact that the first camera I bought was a Canon, and then I um, started getting into using. Um, yeah, I went and bought some more expensive lenses, and therefore your journey is to change brands becomes very expensive. Um, but Canon are actually winning the arms race at the moment with with cameras. They their recent move to mirrorless cameras has made them produce some absolutely exceptionally good cameras. So the Canon R five I'm using at the moment is so good for my macro photography, landscape photography. The focus system on it's really good. So, um, but you know, no doubt. Sony, etc., will you know that they, they, they're all racing with each other. So sometimes one's winning a race, and another time another's winning a race. You know they all produce very good cameras. Um, but this they, damsel yeah. fly that I'm watching clean it's is it cleaning its water tension in these? Yeah, areas? yeah, yeah. So like I say, a lot of my photography is done super early on the morning. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, how big is that thing? Because those are water droplets, and they look they look can, big yeah. in this image. Yeah, well, it's taken it about three times magnification. So it's a damselfly. So you've got damselflies and dragonflies, and damselflies are the smaller ones out of that that group, Odonata. Um, so the head is probably oh, five millimeters wide from eye to eye. Uh, this but is those, a, those, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, they're dew drops. Um, so yeah, in the UK. Uh, all the way through summer really but generally not so much in july and august um if it's been a nice cold evening um and it's been humid you'll get dew forming so you know you walk through grass and your feet get wet um that is a fantastic time to be doing macro insect photography because uh, early on the morning they'll all be covered in that dew um and it makes for amazing photographic conditions so a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the images i take are stacked and I, I, we can come on to that in more detail where i'll take multiple images and then i'll merge them together to give me a bigger depth of field but 
to do that, you need the insects to be still. And obviously, first thing in the morning, the insects tend to be still. But at a certain point, they'll wake up and they'll start cleaning all this dew off, which is, and at that point, I used to just sort of pick my camera up and walk away because I couldn't do any more stack photography. And then one day I was like, well, why don't I just do a video of the insect? That might look pretty groovy. So I've got all these videos now of insects cleaning dew off themselves. But it, it tends to work really well with these damselflies because... The, the way their eyes refract the light, you can see it there. It looks like two big pupils looking at you, um, which it isn't two big pupils looking at you. It's just the way that the light um, interfaces with the, um, the the surface of the insect's eye. But it makes you, you can almost sort of like relate to them as like little cartoon characters. Yeah, it's, uh, so again, this is eliciting in me something that I've never experienced before in insects. And one is I'm anthrop anthropomorphizing this that's the bug. word I, was, I had it in the tip of my tongue but i, I didn't dare say it because i knew i'd say it wrong you got it <laughs> well wrong. well that is exactly what i'm doing because it looks cute um yeah then i'm thinking thank evolution to the stars that these things aren't the size of tigers or elephants because <laughs> the world would be a horrific place um with with creatures that look like this flying around and being able to have a crack at humans. If we, well, we oh, wouldn't well, be it, here. Somewhere on a planet somewhere, these things are, 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 are ruling because they managed to grow so large. And, you know, oh, the, absolutely. Prim the primates Just got scroll. eaten. So if you scroll up my Twitter feed a little bit, and then I'll get you to stop. I want you to find a specific species. It's one I photograph a lot. They're, they're crazy things, ruby-tailed wasps. But that, yeah, that one of those, that'll do. Yeah, that looks sinister as hell, that thing. That looks like a creature out of Mad Max. So yeah, so that's, that's a robber fly. Um, and the, these things are crazy. So, again, you know, if, before I got into macro photography, I thought we just had flies, flies, bees and wasps mm. that, and dragonflies. That was, that was sort of as far as my knowledge went. Um, and then when I started getting into macro photography and I'd photograph something, I'd be like, what is this? And I started finding these guys, robber flies, which are nearly always hairy. Um, and yeah, obviously me being me being quite inquisitive. So I'd be like, well, what's a robber fly? Anyway, now my knowledge on robber flies is a lot better. So robber flies are a predatory fly and they eat other insects. Um, then they, they, they are they, like if these guys were bigger we'd be we would be done for so i don't know if you can see um just below its eyes it looks almost like it's got a cigar underneath smoking under a beard so that it has this um it has like a large dagger type thing on its head um which is its proboscis um i don't know if you can make that, yeah that's so, that yeah 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 there's a point so, there's a piece of of something tissue yeah it's, it's like, poking like, it from under like a, like a under dagger. under what like, looks like a uh a, a curtain of whiskers yeah yeah and i'm going to explain what all of these bits do in a minute and if you see at the end of its legs it has these really quite savage hooks um, and if you have a look at my work there's lo loads of images of robber flies and i've got videos of them predating things and what have you so what these robber flies do is they'll sit on something like a fence or a wall or a tree branch and they'll just sit there and they'll be motionless and then as something flies over them um, and it can be anything that they will take things like they, they, they'll happily take things which are you know five times their size they'll they'll just they, they sort of sat there like some silent killer drone robot thing and as something flies over it this robber fly will just whoop, fly straight up the hook it'll stick the hooks of these um these legs into it and that proboscis which is like a dagger they basically just whoop, fire straight into the insect through the the other insect's exoskeleton and the, they reckon that that sort of beard type structure is to protect the um protect the robber fly's eyes as it slams that dagger into the other insect it then fills that other insect with um, really powerful toxins, which are these horrendous enzymes, which go into the other insect and they turn the inside of that insect into goo. And then they basically suck that insect dry and just kill it <laughs> very, very quickly and efficiently. And uh, there's, um, 
there's a species of um, of this fly um, in the UK called the hornet robber fly, which I photographed last year, and they're about they're about this big, and maybe about sort of five six centimeters long. Um, and I don't know, it, it, it's almost a bit like you imagine you were walking down the street because so, these hornet robber flies will take they'll they'll take dragonflies no problem. So it's it's a bit like if we were walking down the street and something the size of a sheep with wings just came down, slammed into us, shoved a dagger. They generally do it sort of in the back of the other insect's neck, shoved a dagger in there, filled you full of this um, horrendous toxin, which turns your insides into goo, and then sucks you dried out into a skeleton in about 10 seconds. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's really it's, a good job that these robber flies are, are, are quite small. <laughs> it's horror movie stuff. So look, I... I I've never been the type of person, even when I was a kid, that would pull legs off ants. I would actually get in fights trying to protect ants and spiders. That yeah. was my nature. But mosquitoes and I have a very, very um, aggressive and, uh, well, yeah, I'm contempt not contemptuous of them. I'm actively out to kill as many mosquitoes that come around me. But I think looking at these images, and right now we're looking at what what's this creature called that's a ruby-tailed wasp. ruby tailed wasp which is and that really does look alien it is alien but it's also utterly stunning and this is in the the three times magnification is it again is it of, um of the... that's even that's even higher um these guys are pretty small um so it looks like it's made of plastic and it looks like it's been beautifully painted with gold and and this is very metallic yeah really metallic yeah. metallic green metallic gold hints of rust and and metallic blue and then the eyes just look like they're a perfect plastic cast of yeah. thousands tens of thousands of small dots the only parts of this that actually look natural at this magnification are the whiskers and the wings and they they have a certain organicness to them the rest just looks like it's man-made and has been molded and then, if I, and then if i drop down another image here and this is from june 11 do you know what idea that is twitter's not telling us what year that is oh this year oh it is this yeah. year okay so yeah, you, you... yeah june 11 and then we get a close-up of this pitted skin well it's not skin exoskeleton of the insect and um and again, it just looks like curves of plastic that have been molded specifically. And it now, if if I look at this, there's no way. Even if this thing was annoying the shit out of me, there's, there's oh damn, I said shit, and now I've said it twice. I <laughs> promised our producer that I wasn't going to swear on this one. Um, <laughs> so, well, I've but, not sworn. Once. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, we're doing really well for two potty mouthed Brits. <laughs> I can't. I could never kill something like this. I think if I saw a mosquito under your lens, I might have to start just wearing repellent more and <laughs> and letting them go on their way because these open up a completely different relationship for me with insects. These images where I see this. I don't want to sound cheesy because I'm not a. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not easily swayed by religious or spiritual ideas, but this is like a miracle. So yeah, like yeah, a miracle yeah, yeah. of nature. I, I, the macro world. I mean, it, it did totally. Um, I yeah. Well, again, without sounding cheesy, you know, when I started looking through a macro lens, it did open up an entire another world to me. To me, um, I, and I've and I've made so many connections to it as well. You know, um, I, and that's one of the reasons that I really like Twitter is, you know, it's like on that one you just showed about the ruby-tailed wasp. I've been looking at ruby-tailed wasps and looking at that pitted surface of their metallic body, thinking, what the hell's, why is, why has it got that? And, that, you know, and I just posted the, on Twitter, I was like, why does a ruby-tailed wasp have a pitted surface? And then loads, I'm connected to loads of entomologists on Twitter, and they're a pretty nice, friendly community. And, you know, people just come on with various different theories because nobody really knows. That's one of my favourite images from this year. Um, this thing looks so compelling. I want to go and give it a hug. Yeah, doesn't it look cute? Cute bee oh, today. Oh, it's a bee. It's a leaf cutter. 
Yeah, it turns out it was a again. You see, so I've posted that on Twitter. Um, photographed this rather cute bee today, leaf cutter question mark, and people are straight on in the comments. Yeah, it's a Willoughby leaf cutter. Really looks nice like, book. It looks like a teddy bear waiting for a, a hug. It's uh, it's in a hole in a tree, rotten tree or oh, dead tree, I should say. It's not it's actually a fence. Oh, is it? Okay, because you can't uh, see yeah, that. Yeah. Obviously, you can only no. see the wood around it. And again, this one's light brown with rust colours, and but it has a shape and furriness to it. And it's um, what are the antennae called that stick out? Um, the these these two bits here, Oliver. What are these called? Antennae, yeah, yeah, yeah. they are antennae, yeah. Um, so it all there's just something about it that looks can rather endearing. Huge, could, yeah. If it was huge, you'd want to give it a cuddle and until it probably eat, ate your face off. Yeah, those jaws do look pretty pretty savage. It's an interesting question, isn't it? What, so I'm an armchair biologist. I'm really fascinated by cell biology, actually, because I think if we can figure out how the cell works in its, in its across a multitude of environments and in different organs, then we can probably do away with illness eventually. Um, I think we focus too much on the on on the organs rather than the cellular processes going on within the organs but i'm also not a reductionist i'm actually i i, I abhor reductionism when it comes to looking or making decisions about life because we actually are all one interconnected uh group planet you know we've only got one planet everything's connected as we know and i've spoken at large with various scientists about those connections but for me the I never lose the fascination with the a the multitude of species that this planet has sp sp spawned forth, but more so just how over time these functions and features have developed. That in many cases they they're not they're not necessarily just functional. They seem to have a an intentionality behind them that's more than just function. Like hey. I needed to be, and I'm sure it doesn't know its name, but I needed to be a, a rather cute leaf cutter bee because that was the gap in the uh, in the evolutionary process. These tawny owls, they're cute as hell. Now, again, I'm anthropomorphizing. Right? I'm projecting onto them cuteness, but there's so much. There's so much, and in fact, I have to stop because I uh, I am. It's completely subjective, but for me, there's so much beauty in nature that's being communicated through these images that again for me it's it's awe inspiring you know and i mean that not in the like hey man that's awesome i mean truly it's awe inspiring i could look at these images all day and all night and never ever tire of it it just i'm just compelled to keep on you are the ultimate clickbait for me i just want to keep going and going and going and i didn't look at these before now because i wanted to be able to do this on the oh god look at that image currently on site looking with dew covered insects that's stunning man you're well, an artist i do i and virtually none of this stuff's on my website so it's quite a good way of doing it is going via the twitter you're feed. an artist honestly and the barn owl Taita alba my favorite bird as a kid i was obsessed by them i i literally had i must have had 20 or 30 posters of barn owls on my walls they're yeah, the most they're beautiful. beautiful i mean I, I, I like that as an image and it's pretty much a barn owl's bum, but yeah. um, it works as an image, I think. Yeah. But uh, it, to your point, and it's a bit like where I didn't mean to contradict you as such, but where you said you think it's in a dead tree and I said a fence post. You can contradict then, me. It's all right. I'm used to it. Then we were talking about evolution as well. It's quite interesting that actually uh, fence posts for me are like, and a lot of people don't realise that a lot of my macro photography is done on fence posts because the you can't tell it's a fence post, but insects have filled that sort of that niche of where you know we've got far fewer trees about than we used to have, um, mm. but fence posts are dead trees for, and so they, they they tend to be a really good habitat for finding a whole load of my subjects. So a lot of the jumping spiders I photograph are on fence posts. Stuff like that, um, that leaf cutter bee that live, would normally live in holes in dead trees, they live in dead fence posts. And it's much easier to get to a fence post than it is a dead tree because they tend to be at the sides of paths. So anybody who's wanting to get into macro photography, 
fence posts and fences are actually brilliant places to do macro photography. <laughs> Guess is what I'm saying. Eh? But it's, we- yeah, it, it, it's bizarre. It's not something that would have been there with nature. Oh, well, it would they'd be there as nature, but as dead trees. But as there's not as many dead trees about, insects have uh, filled that gap with um, with fence posts. I'm going through these images and barn owls, for me, I could look at images of barn owls all day, every day. They're such a a perfectly developed hunter oh silent, yeah that's silent, silent feathers yeah. and um the whiteness is has always been a bit confusing the tawny owl to me it makes sense it's camouflage and i'm not sure what the benefit is because it has to have a benefit of the white well they're not they're not indigenous to the uk are they they um what barn owls yeah yeah oh i, did, oh, I didn't know that now are they from a more northern no, more southern, I think. I think they're more of an age. Ah, you know, just if you just go up again, Mike, just click that video, not that one. Uh, that's a jumping spider jumping, which is fairly cool. But this one here, right? Just pause there. What I was telling you about robber flies. So here we've got a robber fly, which is predated. It's predated a dance fly. So we're looking head on at the robber fly here. The robber fly is facing us. So that's its two big eyes. It's got its proboscis in the back of the neck of a dance fly. It's injected it with that toxin and it's sucking the toxin out of the dance fly. And it does it that hard that the dance fly's head implodes. So that's what you're seeing in that video. That head <laughs> is literally imploding, isn't it? It, it implodes, yeah. It, it yeah, looks it's like plastic sucked. that has. Yeah, yeah it's just like somebody's sucked all the air out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's pretty... so, so look, I could go on for hours here. I, I'm finding it really actually quite amusing that I, I'm going down through these images and on the right here, because I actually don't use Twitter very often, but um, it, look, it's telling us what's happening. Twitter's telling us what's happening. Latest updates and results from the August 2 primaries. Big Mouth streaming SETI app. Oh, that's something to do with here. In uh, That's an ad here in indonesia then i've got national boob day apparently i just want to make <laughs> uh, make it really clear that that's not something i've been searching for um that's telling me it's trending and then i've got governor gavin newsom declares a state of emergency in california over the spread of monkeypox here we go again um I, the reason i'm highlighting the fact that we've got twitter telling us all this stuff is that there's a world out there the natural world, even at this tiny little level of insects and all the way up to the barn owls and the tawny owls and larger mammals. There's a world that doesn't give a shit about all of this. Well, it can't give a shit because it doesn't even know about it, about what's going on in these news feeds. And we've become so obsessed and so addicted to constant drama across digital news at the expense, yep. like we touched on earlier, at the expense of our relationship with nature. And my my biggest fascination is really how the relationships that we have, we humans, uh, with nature, and how in, in so many cases that's degrading. But then in others, like yourselves, it's it has a chance of restoring. And I think that your imagery... And people like you, because I know there's other superb photographers out there. But the imagery like this, like this barn owl here, it has the ability to restore our relationship with nature to some degree, at least. And people who are not able to get access to the outdoors or, you know, there's plenty of people with no money living in cities who to be Mm -hmm. able to... Get, they don't have access to transport. They may not be able to afford to go out. And also, it would be a terrifying thing to go out into the British countryside if you're an inner city kid living in London, right? Um, because also, so much of land is private in the UK, very different in places like the US where I lived. But um, I think you're doing a, a a service to humanity, and I don't say that lightly, by and a service to nature by taking these photos and then making them available especially making them available in such high quality rather than you know sticking your watermarks all over them and um and putting low res images out if these images and images like it don't elicit in us a love and a compulsion to, uh, to <laughs> interact with nature maybe not that one of you holding two lenses um then i don't know what will and i think that's one of the one of the greatest um uh, the greatest achievements of David Attenborough, who I am a complete fan boy of, is that he has brought the 
beauty and joy of nature into our homes and into our lives so that we actually might give a shit about it rather than our Twitter feeds and endless news yeah. and clicks and likes. So I, I, I say all that because I just want to thank you all. Um, and I mean this, this sincerely. I'm not one to blow smoke up people's asses. I actually quite like a, to do the opposite most of the time. But I want to thank you for being so unbelievably generous with putting out these images that honestly it's like when i was a kid my mum used my na my grandmother used to buy me bird books and animal books and none i none of the photos in them were anything as as exquisite as these images and i would wait for birthdays and special occasions to get bought a new book because they'd be 15 or 20 pounds um which was a a lot of money to my family uh 30 odd 35 years ago um but here it is for free here it is right now on your website and on your twitter feed and i am mesmerized by all of it but i would say even because i do get your point you know i mean even though i'm in leeds and it isn't sort of classed as a really wildlife diverse place i do have access to the banks of the river air and sent uh, numerous places where and I've, I've put a lot of time into learning where things are but even if you are an inner city kid in london you've got hyde park you've got you know you you, you have got areas where you know these banded demoiselles that uh you just gone past there yeah they, they'll be on all the canals in london in the middle of london uh, yeah absolutely no problem yeah any of those ponds in any of the parks in london will all have various dragonfly species on and what have you it is there um yeah but it's well it, it's it's, well, it's no look for it it's you know, it's just most of those inner city kids will not be aware that that stuff is there um and, and know, neither, so, ne neither am i until or was i until yeah. seeing these types of images i'm going to go and look very differently at the at the bugs that we are encouraging and also trying to get rid of on our farm. I mean, there's, we're <laughs> trying to allow a balance there, but this, yeah, this is, um, some of the best macro, my perspective. Some of the best macro photography I see, um, comes from Singapore and, you know, Singapore is just one big city, but the, 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 the parks that are there, um, have do have fantastic macro life in them. Um, yeah, some really, really fantastic macro, nature pictures come out of singapore um which is just one big city so there there is stuff there but again it's just it's just knowing about it um we've been going for over two hours now and that's uh that's no. double pretty much what i've done on any podcast previously and the problem is i could just keep going and going and ask you to describe everything yes, behind each yeah. one of I barely feel like I've scratched the surface as well. I know, well, we haven't we haven't scratched the surface, and I think that's testament to the amount of work and and skill that uh, you have undertaken and developed, respectively, yeah. for each one of these um, to put one of, each one of these images. Um, if uh, people want to find you, if they're not looking at this video, uh, uh, this in a video form, because in video you can see it's Oliver C Wright on Twitter. Uh, it's Oliver Wright Photography, isn't it? On, yeah on twitter writes with a w at o w underscore photography um okay. oh is it okay that... it's not oliver c writer on twitter no no it's that bit just after oh at o w there you go that shows how completely inept i am at twitter <laughs> but the, right. the easiest way is just to go to my website which is oliver and then on there there's a link to facebook twitter youtube all of those type of things um because I mean, I do do. I've got various YouTube videos as to how I do this. Macro oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, All right. So if people want to get into it, they can find you there. Uh, look, yeah. I could. Uh, there's 22,000 tweets on here, and I'm assuming they're all of this kind of quality. So uh, I could lose hours and hours and hours, but. Um, I just want to thank you again for sharing and being so generous with all of this content. And I yeah, think, no problem, Mike. Yeah. I, I think it has the capability to really compel people to look closer um at both the, the small world of insects and also out to the to the uh larger world of landscapes with a different eye um this stuff is what i personally could you know if i was to reinvent my life again i'd i'd be a wildlife photographer but like i said 
Don't have the eye. Look, we'll leave on that one. Meet Millie. Face of pure yeah, cuteness or a face of evil. One of my brothers. <laughs> if you're a rat or rabbit, that's a face of evil. To me, it's oh, a... she is. Yeah, as she a... is. She is area through and through. As a dog lover, that's the face of uh, a face of cuteness. Um, all. Yeah. I think we'll end it there with nearly two uh, yeah. over two hours. It's been absolutely fantastic. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, cheers, the host, um, We'll do another one, yeah. Where, um, if I can take up on your, your time, and we'll I'll come back with some specific questions. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll field questions from people who are already starting to contact us and ask questions, um, and so maybe we'll do a Q and A around you know technique and and the likes. Yeah, yeah, style. yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, and hopefully you can sort of see a bit of the journey of my life and how, how it's changed my view of the world as well from being corporate slave to, um, insect nerd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, um, overly lit offices of British retail, um, with for mica tables, I would imagine, um, versus the utter, splendor and wonders of nature seen through these lenses is um that would be a hard one to ever return to the former from for this. sure for right. sure i can see why you take a pay cut to do this stuff <laughs> all right my friend it's been no, it's fantastic i'm gonna cut the uh recording there uh it's been a complete and utter joy let's stop the share thank you so much yeah